Right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much indeed for joining. My name is Charlie Winkworth Smith, and I lead the Neurotechnology Innovation Network at the KTN. Uh, welcome to, to today's webinar, which is on the UK's neurotechnology capabilities. We're going to hear from different organisations about how they can help you commercialise your new neurotechnology devices. Um, so I'll just quickly run through the uh, protocol for today. Due to the large number of people registered, all participants will be muted. If you've got any technical problems, then please do use the chat box um, and my colleague Poonam should be able to help you. If you have any questions for the speakers, then please use the Q&A box. Um, there's going to be plenty of time for questions after each presentation, so, so do remember to, to type your questions in. Um, and finally, the presentation, uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on YouTube uh, shortly afterwards. So I'm just going to give a, a very quick introduction and then we'll hear from uh, Lisa Harty and Alex Casson about the Henry Royce Institute. Uh, Tom Beale will then introduce the Centre for Process Innovation, CPI. Anne van Hostenberg will then uh, give us an introduction to the Manufacture of Active Implant and Surgical Instruments Facility, the Maisie Facility. And finally, we'll hear from Matt Taylor, who's going to give us an introduction to health economics. As you can see, there's a Q&A section um, after each presentation, so, so do remember to, to type your questions in. And then we'll finish with a short uh, panel discussion. So if any of you are new to the KTN's Neurotechnology Innovation Network, uh, we're here to help. We're here to try and bring together and grow the neurotechnology community in the UK to help you accelerate the commercialization of your new technologies. Um, so please do get in touch if, if you've not been in touch before. It'd be great to find out what you're doing and hopefully we can make some uh, useful connections for you. Today is the fourth in our uh, webinar series. So previously we've looked at bioelectronic medicines, brain computer interfaces, neurotechnology for dementia, all of which are now um, on YouTube. So if you've missed them, do, do go and have a listen. Um, today, of course, is all about neurotechnology capabilities. And then on the 12th of November, we have quantum magnetic sensors for brain imaging, which should be absolutely fascinating. The registration page for that uh, should be up uh, tomorrow, so, so do keep your eyes open for that. Um, but it'd be really good to get your input into what topics uh, you would like to be covered next. Um, so my colleague Poonam now is going to just take us over to Menti. So, if you can all, um, on your phones or on your computer, go to www.menti.com and then use the code 5498375. Then please do tell us what topics you would like to be covered um, in future neurotechnology webinars. So we'll just give that a minute or so to um, come through. Don't be shy. I'm sure there are some other topics you would like covered. Okay, so something perhaps on, on the UK landscape. Would would ethics be, be of interest? Okay, how to work with international partners. That's interesting. Neurotech in robotics and virtual reality, NHS adoption. Okay, some really interesting things coming here. Epilepsy technologies. Translation, that's hopefully something that we'll hear a bit about uh, today. Um, so the code again, if you've missed it, um, is at the top of the screen. So go to www.menti.com and then use the code 5498375. Okay, brilliant. So we'll, we'll keep Menti um, open. Um, so just a uh, fin final time. Uh, do do uh, please let us know your thoughts. Um, but for now, I will hand over to Lisa Harty and Alex Casson, who's going to give us an introduction to the Henry Royce Institute. Lisa. I'm Lisa Harty, and um, I am the, one of the business development managers in the Henry Royce Institute. 
I look after the biomedical materials side. Okay. Um, so the Henry Royce Institute has been established to develop and capitalize on the UK's world leading excellence in advanced biomaterials. Our vision is to be a world leading institute identifying challenges and stimulating innovation in advanced materials research to support sustainable growth and development. We are nine partners across the UK and expanding. The hub is in Royce, Manchester, which is where I'm sitting. Um, and we have had over 200 million investment in 250 open access facilities. We want to be a single front door for the stakeholder community. So we're encouraging people to come through Royce to be, to be able to access the 250 um, facilities and the research expertise in the biomedical materials area and the other areas which Royce supports. But today I'm gonna to speak about the biomedical materials. We want to support and grow world recognized excellence in UK, excellence in UK material research. Um, accelerate commercial exploitation and deliver positive economic impact for the UK. How are we going to do that? You know, we're working at the moment with enabling national materials research foresighting. We're looking at national materials challenges. We're working with stakeholders to identify key research, research areas which we can work on together. We have the 250 um, pieces of equipment which are open to everybody across the UK. And we want to work with you, our stakeholders, to catalyze on the industrial collaboration. Across all of this, the training of the students and the um, users is very important to us. Equally, we found there's an interest from the equipment manufacturers to understand what is the future needs of the materials community? What, what equipment do they need to develop for the future? And how will they train those future users of that equipment? So with regards to the biomedical materials theme, again, the same, the same vision and values, we want to accelerate the discovery, manufacture and translation of biomedical materials using our state of the, state of the art technology platforms. So again, the facilities that I highlighted earlier for biomedical materials, we've broken them down into five um, technology platform areas. Alex is going to speak in a moment about these areas in a bit more detail. Um, I'm just going to highlight here that we're also looking at um, identifying key research areas and national biomedical materials challenges. So this um, big slide here is, is we've whittled down um, for many stakeholder engagements how we will address the national materials challenge of materials for personal health. This is driven mostly by the fact that globally the number of individuals aged 60 plus is projected to reach 1.4 billion by 2030 and this is going to accelerate a demand for curative and affordable biomedical materials. <clears throat> you will see here that we have engage with the community and something that they're quite keen on is making it bespoke. Um, we've kind of seen that firsthand with the PPE when it came to COVID-19. They wanted to make it locally as well. So we're looking at ways to make things bespoke, personal and locally. There's also addressing the global healthcare challenges. We've been working with, um, with Bangalore in India. So they are looking at um, 3D printing of new implants. They want to look at improving the, the impact and lifespan of implants, but also what we found is that there is differences in, in the skeletal um, anatomy in patients across different ethnicities and a one size fits all off the shelf is not always the best option. So this is where we're going to be taking the personalized side of things. And you will see how we have engaged with the stakeholder community and how we will continue to engage with the stakeholder community. Across all these areas, the regulation and how we develop new standards to test to will be very important. So this one, again, very busy slide. I'm happy for feedback on all of your slides here. 
um, we, we develop these with the stakeholder um, community. So all feedback that you have is greatly appreciated. Um, these are research areas that our stakeholder community have identified as important. Um, and these are developing a new generation of smart dynamic biomaterials, biomimetic tissue analogs, synthetic cell microenvironments to study interactions, materials for tissue healing. Again, that's across all therapeutic areas. We've identified a few there. Um, here, probably the, the nervous system side of things will be quite important. Um, devices to restore biological function. These are just some examples of what we can do. Um, future examples, micro tissues on a chip, combining microfluidics and omics real-time analysis. But all of this, these materials challenges, and which area, I think might not be possible without the technology platforms, which Alex is going to describe now. Thank, thank you very much, Lisa. Um, so my name is Alex. My day job, as it were, is at the University of Manchester. I'm a reader there in electronic engineering. And then within the Royce Institute, I've been leading on bioelectronic facilities that are going to be installed in the Royce Hub building, which is also based in Manchester. Uh, so before going over some of those facilities that we have available um, and are intended as a national facility for people from across the country to come and use openly to complement their own facilities or to minimise the kind of local investment that they have to do. Um, I just wanted to spend a, a very little bit of time going over the kind of big picture as we see it. And this might be a little bit off topic for this um, for this webinar, um, but I think useful in terms of seeing the direction of travel and where, where we see we can add some value to this kind of roadmap. Uh, so we have the next slide, please, Lisa. So in terms of that big picture, uh, you know, we have current clinical practice today, which is basically one size fits all. Everybody gets the same thing. You know, there's a little bit more kind of dynamic risk prediction based on some high level factors, but you describe that as one, one size fits all overall. And next, Lisa. And then of course, there's very big kind of MRC, NIHR type investments in precision medicine, in personalized medicine, which in this framework work, if you, know, if you think of them from the genetic point of view. So precision medicine, would be about identifying subgroups of people. Obviously, you can't just look at people and determine what subgroup they're in, but looking at um, their genetics being data-driven for that. And then the step beyond that would be personalised medicine. And so you may have two people who belong to the same subgroup, but of course they're still individuals with their own genetics, with their own life exposure. And personalised medicine would be trying to target medicines down to that individual. So where we see the kind of big technology opportunities and there's lots of materials research that underpins all of these different ones, is then kind of the step beyond that. So as we move beyond kind of a single time stop type measurement, we can start to do time varying medicine, so circadian medicine. And this might be with real time kind of point of care, type biosensors. It might be with wearable sensors or implantable sensors, but giving real-time information with regards to when do you optimally say deliver, deliver a treatment. And then we step beyond that is to start closing the loop. So doing automatic treatment release when it's the optimal time based upon the measured data to do that. So that would be closed loop medicine. Of interest to this space is bioelectronic medicine for this grouping. So that would be when you're interfacing directly with the body's electrical system, the nerves or the, the brain directly, maybe. And then of course, there's lots of interest in nanomedicine, 
in using nanoparticles to carry drugs, say, to a target site in nanorobotics. And so there's lots of different types of medicine that we see emerging and lots of different kind of materials type research. Within the Royce Institute, you know, we're probably looking at the low TRL end of what you might be doing. And certainly within my own um, research portfolio, we then say partner with CPI who look at the kind of scale up um, and moving towards the kind of mass manufacture and that sort of aspect of um, the uh, research that we want to be doing, the development that we want to be doing. So within the bio suite in voice, it's broken down into a number of sub suites and all of these are essentially charge out facilities. Um, and it might be that if you're an, an academic or a company, you need access to all of these or to just one of these. Um, and we can support um, both of those different models, you know, depending on what you, um, depending on what you need access to. There are clean rooms within Royce, but uh, if, you're, if you're doing a clean room based manufacturer, they're kind of outside of the bio suite. Um, and in terms of neurotech, you might well be better placed to speak to uh, Maisie at UCL, which we're going to hear about later in this webinar. So um, we instead, within the bio suite and voice, we've invested in additive manufacturing facilities. And there's, you know, there's kind of a few gaps on this in terms of the resolution axis on the x-axis there. But broadly, you know, we've got a complete suite of additive manufacturing facilities at different scales to cater to whatever it is you might be interested in making. Of course, as the feature size that you're interested in gets smaller, then um, the rate at which we can manufacture it also gets smaller. One of the key things about Royce and how we're set up is the bio suite is all in one place. So we've got these different sub suites and they're next to one another and we can start connecting these things, these things up. We can start um, having a, a pipeline of different activities that you can do all in the um, one place. So we, the second part of that suite is for nanofiber, um, so electrospinning based manufacture. And for the neurotech community, probably most interest here is the ability to spin hydrogels. And I can imagine there's probably quite a few people in this community who are interested in hydrogels for the fundamental biological interface. This can also be used for making conductive fibers if you were looking at um, textile body, body interfaces, probably for, probably for kind of wearable electronics in, in that sort of space. We then have an imaging suite um, for doing all kind of different forms of conformal, I'm uh, sorry, confocal mycography, um, doing that while stimulating cells um, various different types of yeah, just optical characterization. And then we also have a mechanical characterization suite, which uh, I, I think might be of, of a lot of interest to people in, in this community. Essentially getting their devices, their electrodes, say, and being able to evaluate them repeatedly under different temperatures, different pressures, different pHs, um, and be able to do that in a, in a controlled environment, look at how they fail. And then we can link that up with some of the bioelectronic facilities to see how the electrical properties change as you do kind of that um, fundamental low level testing. Within bioelectronics then, we've then got a spectrum of facilities. So firstly, for just the, oh, sorry, can you go back? Right. For the um, electrical interface with, with biology. 
and then doing in vitro electrical characterization principally through um, EIS and being able to do that with high channel count systems so we can do kind of high throughput um, characterization. For materials characterization, a lot of emphasis on kind of low frequency, low flicker noise. Um, so making sure we can do measurements accurately at that very low frequency range at which biology operates. And then of course, for a lot of people, once they've made their fundamental material, you've still got to get that into a complete system, um, be able to kind of stream the data off, all of those kind of practical things. And so there's some system creation um, facilities as well. And I put on the slide here, just some examples. And just, just for ease, these all come from, come from me. Um, but at the top, we've got electrodes for doing EEG monitoring. And these are 3D printed, but then they're coated with silver silver chloride. And so functionally, they have the same material as we use for medical electrodes today. If you were to have an EED in the clinic, they would be silver silver chloride electrodes. But now we can personalize them. We can have different electrodes for different people, different parts of the head. In the middle, we've got kind of John Rogers style, if you're familiar with John Rogers' work from Northwestern University, both kind of temporary to two conformal type electronics, but here made using facilities in voice. And at the bottom, we've got a conductive uh, textile. So this was actually a textile that was dip coated in a, um, a graphene ink. And here we're testing it. We're using some of the system creation facilities. We're testing it on a head phantom. I know it's not head safe in this case, uh, just done as a cuboid, but then we can know what we're meant to be recording and we can do a kind of a closed loop evaluation of the of the material to see are we recording what we're meant to be recording and that's kind of linking linking together some of the different facilities that we have in the bio suite so back to you lisa thanks alex um so just generally then how to get involved um, we're the main ROI site, which will give um, more information than just the biomedical material side. So I'd encourage you to, to look at that website. Um, for any inquiries or booking of equipment, you can, you can go through the info at, at ROI's email address. But to be honest, if it's going to be for biomedical materials, I'm happy for you to email me any questions. Um, we have um, the, the facilities catalogue online, and this has all, all of our equipment online, and all of those pieces of equipment have facility managers, and they'd be the gurus for that, that equipment. I think if you've got an idea of what, you, what your challenge is, I think it's worth exploring it. You don't need to know what piece of equipment you need or what, what expertise you need. It would be ju just good to share what you have a challenge with, and we can then identify what we can support support you with um, but if you do know feel free check the catalog and see what we have we have a number of access schemes that would be quite useful for providing funded engagement with the henry royce the student equipment access scheme is open at the moment and this is for students across the country and we tried this time not to make it just to particular, um, you know, postgrads or RAs. I mean, it's it's quite open. So if you can build a case why you would like to use the the um, equipment, we would be happy to kind of review that. And then we have an SME equipment access scheme, and that's going to be launched this week. And this is for the SMEs to come to us with a focused idea of a research challenge they have that would require Royce equipment technical support and that's something that we would be able to facilitate funding. Ongoing we have event series throughout the year. Um, we will have a large stakeholder event later in the year which everybody's more than welcome to join. It looks like it's possibly going to be March but watch this space. And after that just to say thank you and if you do have any questions happy for you to contact, contact me. Brilliant, thank you both. Um, we've had a few uh, questions pop up here. So uh, first of all, from Benedict, um, what is the advantage of going through the Institute rather than directly to university partners? Shall I answer that? Yeah. Um, I think what we've found is that 
we have so much equipment across the partnership that it means that you you get the option of what is available across the partnership and different partners have different um, expertise so if you come you kind of have the research expert at, as long as as well as the equipment so you're getting like the full package of not just access to the equipment you're getting the questions on why are you doing this and is this the right way or could you do it this way and kind of we just scope it out a bit more and I think that's I'm not saying they don't do that individual individual partnerships but I think being together gives you access to everything um, and it, it gives you more options of what you want to achieve. Yeah okay thank you and Deepak Kumar from the University of Oxford asks uh, collaborations to utilise such equipment and res resources, would this pose issues on arising IP and ownership? I think, am I going to do this one? Yeah, <laughs> just check on Alex. Um, no, no, I mean, we, we kind of work the same as um, Innovate do and, and UK or I do. We look at what's the, you know, the best place to commercialise the research. So I think we'd have to look at each um, project in a case-by-case and see what each party is coming in with. No, I, I, it, it wouldn't. Okay. Um, we've also got a, page, uh, a question. Um, oops, sorry, just lost it. Um, are these developments grant-led or industry uh, demand-led? Um, and is this demand based on global or UK demands? Great question. Um, I'll start trying to answer it. So when I think I suppose the question I have is, the demand side of it. So you'll see what we've highlighted in terms of we are open access facilities. So people can come to us with all of their questions um, and that's like open all the time. But in the background, what we're looking at is identifying the material challenges that there is for the UK. Um, and those would be like the national challenges, like the personal, personal health challenge. And then after that we're looking at research area challenges and what we're doing there is again this is stakeholder community led so feel free anybody to comment on what we've written down but what we do there is we look at where the UK is best place to advance that research in order for it to eventually become commercializable research so if, if they're talking about the demand where it's coming from that demand is coming from the stakeholder community and at what point do you want to start talking to people? Is it just at the idea stage or do you need a, a, a sort of fully formed project plan in place? I think it varies. I think that um, often it helps on the idea st stage just to guide them to what the options are available to them. And then they can factor that into um, their next stages. Obviously, many companies, I mean, the reason we have the SME access scheme is because SMEs, you don't also have the finances so there is ways for them to have finance but often people need to factor in early on into the grant submissions and um, what access they need so it, it does help to kind of work with us um, around the idea stage yeah okay perfect uh yeah so if you're interested then then do get in touch um we'll have to move on now um to the next presentation but thank you very much um lisa and alex um, they'll be around for the panel session uh, at the end. So do keep those questions coming in and Alex and Lisa should be able to, to type some uh, answers in as well. Um, so I'll hand over now to uh, Tom Beale, who's the Commercial Development Manager um, at CPI. Tom. Thank you. Sorry, I was just trying to unmute my microphone then. Um, thank you very much for um, introducing me. Um, uh, just a, a, a quick introduction to who I am and, and what we do, and then, then I'll, I'll get into the presentation. So, um, as Charlie said, my name is Tom Beale. Um, I'm the Commercial Development Manager at, at CPI for MedTech. So, what this really means is I spend my time um, talking to companies, talking to groups about commercialization of their medical technologies in all different areas, um, understanding what they need to do, working through their, their commercialization process, and how they're going to get their products to market, how they're going to develop their products. Um, and then working out how we at CPI can help them um, together with other institutes within the UK and, and other partner organisations. Um, uh, I'm a physicist by background. Before joining CPI, I've been at CPI for about three years. Um, before joining CPI, I worked as clinical engineering um, within Newcastle Hospitals Trust. 
Um, and I've also spent some time um, doing a consultancy for regulatory compliance for medical devices as well. Um, okay, so just a little bit of understanding as to um, what CPI does and how it interacts with the, with the ecosystem. Um, so what th this is the sort of um, raison d'etre to CPI. Um, our, our mission really is to help companies in commercialise and scale up their processes. And this isn't limited to medtech or even healthcare. This covers a whole range of different market sectors uh, and, and, and technologies, um, which I'll, I'll get into in a bit. Um, so um, CPI is part of the high value manufacturing catapult system. Um, so the catapult system in general is set up to increase economic output within the UK um, and to really try and um, develop the um, uh, economic activity within the um, uh, more high value and high technology space. Um, and this is particularly within the high value manufacturing catapult. So CPI is one of seven organisations within this grouping. Um, and we also work closely with other catapult centres, such as the Medicines Discovery Catapult and the Compound Semiconductor Applications Catapult as well, which are, which are outside this, the HVMC. Um, so the catapults are, are funded um, through, um, uh, directly through government to a certain extent, and that allows the catapults to exist um, and, uh, and allows us to sort of develop our capabilities. Um, how we sit within the, the ecosystem and the infrastructure, um, what, we, what we're not trying to do is we're not trying to develop the sort of blue sky research and uh, the invention. And really that's um, the remit of the university sector, the academic sector within the UK. Um, and what we try and do is help develop those um, inventions and really bring those innovations through into the commercial sector. So the, the catapults were set up with the realisation that the UK is very strong in invention and has a very strong academic um, uh, uh, remit um, but actually what historically it hasn't been particularly good at is taking those academic ideas and commercializing those and bringing those forward um, both for um, UK commercial benefit but actually also in this case for um, patient benefit within the UK as well and actually driving that, that, that patient benefit. Um, so as you would expect um, from a research organisation, we have quite an uh, established um, asset, group, asset, asset group, both in um, expertise and also equipment, and I'll get onto that a little bit later, but actually that's only one aspect of how we help companies. Um, there are two other really important aspects that I'd, I'd just like to bring your attention to. Um, the first at the bottom right is our knowledge and application of innovation process. So really what this means is helping companies startups, spin-outs in their business development in the um, technology landscape and actually being able to assist them in developing and growing their, their businesses. Um, we do this through a number of different ways. Quite often this is through informal discussions with um, our, our, um, our colleagues within CPI in order to understand that process and understand where they, where they need to get to. Um, but we do have more formal um, methodology for doing this as well through our innovation integrator model which looks separately at 11 different factors that a, that a business has to um, consider as they're developing. So this covers everything from supply chain to IP to the team um, and really helps them understand where they are and where their weaknesses and strengths are in order to actually be able to build on those weaknesses and, and, and turn them into strengths um, and, and be ready for, for um, development and, and, and help them actually become successful as a small enterprise. Um, and, and finally, on this, um, on this triangle, we've got expertise in securing funding. And really, this, this comes into two different areas. Um, within CPI, we have an established bid um, proposal team, and they help companies in developing their um, bids and developing their funding. Um, so we are often co-applicants on grant applications like Innovate UK or in the health tech space. Um, that includes NIHR funding, such as the I4I. Um, and, and really that enables a, uh, a stronger application of grants going through. Um, in addition to that, we also have our CPI enterprises arm and they have strong relationships with the investment community such that they can connect up um, companies with investors that are looking to invest in that particular area or that particular 
particular funding. So we have investors that are particularly interested, for example, in um, investing in medical technologies um, and not just in software. Um, and, and in addition to that, um, we also have um, CPI Enterprise is also able to make um, small investments themselves as well in companies. Um, so as I said, in addition to medtech, um, we also work in a number of different value, um, high value markets as well, including um, pharmaceuticals, aerospace um, and, and various other areas as well. And this is really underpinned by a, a small number of core capabilities, which are housed in a number of um, uh, areas within the UK. Um, so these uh, cover things like biotechnology and biotherapeutics as well um, and, and pharmaceutical processing which we have quite large capabilities in. Um, so CPI is um, mostly focused in the northeast of England. Um, our head office is in Wilton which is the old ICI plant on, on Teesside um, and, and we have a number of other offices through Teesside and, and County Durham as well and a number of other facilities. Um, we are in the process of constructing the Medicines Manufacturing Innovation Centre up in Glasgow as well, and this is a, um, a joint venture between, led by CPI, but in collaboration with a, um, two of the major pharmaceutical manufacturers as well. Um, these are a few numbers to give you an idea of the, the size and scale of CPI. It's grown a little bit since this side, so it's more like 450, 500 staff at the moment. Um, we've got a significant, almost 200 million um, uh, investment in assets and what this really means is is infrastructure and um, equipment that is utilized by um, ourselves and by companies in order to develop their products and, and, and bring their products forward um, and we've been around for about 15 years as part of the part of the catapult system so just to focus a little bit on medtech and how we um, can assist companies in this area um, we really work in two areas we help accelerate um, the development of medtech and, and not only that we also really try and help that adoption and help understand how um, companies can get their products to market um, successfully. So in terms of accelerating medtech development um, we've got a number of um, different areas where we can we can really work on this with companies. Um, within, our, within CPI we've got a strong capability within formulations manufacturing and formulations development. Um, so this is where we can develop and exploit new materials. So this might be new plastics or new, new gels. Um, it might be new conductive inks. Um, it might be um, developing new ways of formulating um, uh, APIs or that kind of thing. Um, uh, and, and we've got a, a extensive capability of formulating these and uh, analyzing new materials. Um, in terms of in, uh, integrating advanced systems, what we're really talking about here is being able to develop um, smart electronic systems. So this might be electronic systems, it might be um, photonic systems within your devices in order to make that, that diagnostic or, or therapeutic um, technology. What we really try to do all the time is design these devices for manufacture. So design these devices or design the technology such that it can be built at the scale that is needed to be built at commercially. Um, so what we don't tend to do is, is make a one-off and go, okay, we've, we've managed to make this one, but you know it's impossible to make tens or hundreds that you, you need to be able to make. Um, obviously, that number will depend on what the application might be. So if it's for a, you know, a rare disease type, it might be that ultimately you're only trying to make hundreds of devices and therefore a fairly manual process can be appropriate. If you're doing a more common diagnostic test or a monitoring, then actually you might need tens of thousands of these devices. And so it's designing that product such that it can be made in the, in the appropriate scale. Um, we've got uh, expertise in electronics, which I'll go on to go into a little bit more detail. Um, and all of the development that we do for MedTech is um, developed under our certified 13485 um, quality management system. So um, the work that we do is entirely appropriate for taking devices on to be um, used within clinical trials or CEMAR. In terms of accelerating that medtech adoption, how do we actually help those products get further? Well, from the beginning, from our, the, the very first discussions we have with companies, we're always trying to understand the, the value proposition that the company is putting forward or the group is putting forward in terms of where their technology is going to fit in. So understanding who the users are going to be who's going to buy the technology, where that's going to fit in the care pathway, how that is actually going to be utilised, who's going to be using it, um, 
and really understanding that process through and helping the company try and understand that process and develop that process. And that's not necessarily done, in, done on our own. And we have strong collaborations both um, in the clinical and, and, and actually non-clinical partners as well. So we work closely with the likes of the Academic Health Science Networks. Um, you're going to get a talk later on from um, uh, uh, Health Economics and YHEC, who we work with closely on a number of projects. Um, and, and really what we try and do is, is bring together all the expertise that we need to in order to really understand your product and make your product um, get to get commercialized and get adopted um, so that will be um, in addition to our developing the technology will assist you in setting up clinical trials and, and getting those and although they wouldn't be delivered by CPI we can help introduce you to um, clinical colleagues or, or, or trusts in the region and, and throughout the country that can help you in, in running those clinical trials um, I think it goes without saying that before that process um, the technology needs to be tested um, on, on bench testing and 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 um, as much preclinical testing as possible in order to ensure the technology is safe before that's taken on board and much of that we can do in-house. Um, and what we're really aiming to do is try and get your product such that you can access a global market with this um, and, and not just a single site or a single position. I thought um, given the, the focus of this is neurotechnology then actually the um, expertise and capabilities that we've got within electronics and flexible electronics might be of interest to a number of groups. So I just want to highlight some of the areas that we've got, got in electronics. Um, so if we go through this, what we've, um, we do have extensive clean room facilities within our electronics facility, and this includes um, things like um, spin coating and slot die coating, um, photolithography um, and various other coating technologies. This is principally based on electronics on non-traditional substrates, so glass substrates or plastic substrates. Um, but can be used for laying down electrodes and can be used for, for um, prototyping various different areas and, and building up to a, to a Gen 2 scale, so up to a reasonable full size scale. Um, we also have capabilities within flexible printable electronics, um, and this is enabling us to do roll to roll printing of um, large area electronics and conformable electronics. So this can be useful whereby um, rigid PCBs aren't particularly um, helpful or don't particularly work in that instance. Um, printable electronics is um, fairly niche in how it fits in. Um, it's not um, appropriate for very small and very intricate electronics because the um, limitation of the, of the track size is a few hundred microns, a couple of hundred microns, so it, it, it doesn't work for very small features. But where it does really work well is where you want large area electronics um, or where you want big big sizes and that's where um, printable electronics is really um, uh, really useful. Um, we can also embed electronics into physical devices um, both using printing technologies on, on 2D as I've shown but also um, printing onto 3D surfaces as well um, and this can be used to enable um, smart med tech devices or smart enable smart devices. We've done some work for example on, on um, uh, smart labels where we've been um, enabling to monitor temperature and monitoring um, humidity through the supply chain um, and also looked at um, uh, smart pill packets whereby when a, a tablet is removed from a blister pack then it um, logs the time and date when that um, tablet is used so you can utilize that for um, enabling um, compliance of medical of um, uh, taking pharmaceutical um, ingredients. Okay, um, so just going back to our MedTech Centre, um, our capability for um, MedTech is really focused on our National Healthcare Photonics Centre and this was completed a couple of years ago. Um, and this is where our, the majority of our MedTech development occurs, but that expertise from other areas of CPI feeds into that to enable us to have a much um, bigger ability than just in one centre. So I've talked a little bit about the Electronics Centre we also have our biotechnology and our biologics facility um, in, in Wilton and in, in Darlington, and they um, enable the manufacture of everything from enzymes and antigens to antibodies and assay development. Um, so this really enables us to do a lot of work um, on um, uh, pushing through um, in vitro diagnostics and other sort of diagnostic capabilities as well. 
Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier on about our formulation capabilities in making new materials. This sits next door to our photonic centre, and this enables us to do manufacturing of uh, nanoparticles, fluorescent materials, but also um, new materials such as inks and hydrogels and things like that. Um, so our medtech development site, um, as I said, was established a few years ago. It's fully certified under 13485. We just passed our year two um, audit um, a few weeks ago. Um, and it's about a 2,000 metre facility. Um, I'll go into this a little bit more detail. Um, so this is the reason why I've outlined the, um, uh, outlined the, the floor plan here is just to give you an idea of the variation of the capabilities that we've got on our site here. So um, this is our ground floor, site, ground floor of, the, of the facility, which is mostly our um, uh, laboratory space. Um, and we start off on the left hand side here with our biochemistry and, and, and chemistry lab. And this is really a, a sort of general purpose wet lab that we use to support the rest of our, our area. Um, what's of increasingly usage is our bio facility, our bio labs within our medtech facility. So these are class two category bio labs. So we can handle um, human tissue samples, but we can also handle um, various viruses and various bacterial strains as well. Um, we can grow cell cultures within there. Um, so we can look at the effects of um, various different um, uh, technologies on different cell types um, and be able to do analysis of that work. And actually within that um, biotechnology facility, we also have a um, uh, confocal microscope system um, with fluorescence imaging built in um, off that bio suite. So we can actually do um, imaging of biomaterials directly within those bio labs. Um, next door to that, we have a suite of optics labs and laser labs, um, and that enables us to do optical systems development, and a couple of those are class four um, laser facilities as well. Um, moving further on to the right, we've got our ionizing radiation lab. This is a, effectively a, a, a lead-lined room with a control room next door, and this enables us to do work with um, uh, radionuclides and also with um, X-ray detectors and X-ray emitters as well. Um, and really we can um, develop our work with phantoms and be able to, to develop new phantoms, look at new um, use of radionuclides within different settings. Um, we've got general purpose workshop facility and we've also got this large flexible manufacturing and assembly space. So this is a, just over 200 square meters where we can set up assembly lines for the manufacturer of uh, medical devices. Um, typically, as I say, for clinical trial scale or for pre-market adoption. So here we would be doing, uh, depending on the device, we might be making tens or hundreds of devices. We're not a contract manufacturer, so we wouldn't be making in the thousands, um, but we can do small scale pilot line um, assemblies whereby you can enable um, uh, optimization of your pilot line and look at yields if your device is coming out as well. Um, and actually within this area, we've got our um, additive manufacturing facility as well. So we've got a number of different um, 3D printing um, equipment that we can use within there. Um, upstairs in the facility, we've got a design lab. So this is where our um, initial design work happens. So um, for our physical realization, we use SolidWorks and this is um, coupled with um, Altium for our electronics design and ZMAX for our um, optical design work. Um, and at the other end of the facility, we've got our electronics lab as well, where we can um, produce and populate um, traditional printed circuit boards, also do testing to 60601 um, and, and various other test and development facilities within there as well. Um, it's just worth mentioning one of the way that we work within CPI is that we um, try and work alongside companies in the development of their technology. Um, so we do have flexible office space within the facility where companies can come in and, and, and base themselves within the facility while they're doing um, uh, pieces of work with us, while doing fairly large scale pieces of work with us. So it might be if they're, they're setting up a manufacturing line that they want to be part of it, or if they're doing an ongoing project over several months or years that they want to actually base themselves partly within CPI to, to work closely with us. Um, this is just outlining our device development pathway. So as I mentioned earlier, we're not normally involved in the technology creation right at the beginning, but we would then take that product on um, and take that through the design process, starting with the conceptual design and, and getting as far as um, a pilot manufacturer. 
um, then that device would be taken out for clinical validation and we can then work closely to transition that for, for, for high volume manufacturing. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this is fully within our 13485 process. Um, just a little bit on how we work with companies. There's a couple of different ways that we, we um, engage with companies typically. The first is a purely commercial work where it's a fee for service. Um, and this is probably the quickest way to engage with CPI and the most flexible. Um, and we also work collaboratively, as I mentioned earlier, with um, our um, bid proposal team where we put in um, collaborative projects. Um, there were questions earlier on about IP, so I'll just generally make a comment on that. Um, CPI generally isn't interested in the specific IP of companies, but being a um, research organisation, what we do try and do is enable us to continue to work on the um, types of technology that we want to be able to do. So we, for, so we would want to be able to use the um, processes and techniques that we learn in order to, to take those work to, to utilize that IP in other areas. Um, so it's really the know-how that we're interested in, in gaining, but not the specific IP for that application. Um, and that's a, a, a swift overview of what we do at CPI. If you have any, any queries or you'd like to engage with us, then um, feel free to get directly in touch with myself um, and my contact details are there. Okay, thank you. Brilliant, thanks Tom. Um, we've got time for just one or two questions um, if you want to uh, type them into the chat box, in, sorry, the Q&A box. Um, we've got one question here, um, order of typical costs. <laughs> um, so, how we cost up things is on a project by project basis. So it all depends on um, what the project is that we're, we're doing with people. Um, so we don't have a sort of day rate for coming in and using equipment. We work with companies and work out how um, we can make best um, interact with them and get them to where they want to be. Okay, thanks. One, one thing you mentioned early on was that you can help uh, companies with, with regulations and going through the regulatory pathway. Yeah. Can you, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So um, we see that the regulatory development is, um, goes hand in hand with the technology development. So we can't, in our view, those two things have to be, be developed together. Um, if we're doing the majority of the development of a device, we would build up a technical file for the company alongside that um, and we would, we would effectively take ownership and, and develop that technical file um, and pass that across to the company at the end of it. If we're doing a sort of subcomponent or a part of that, then the, then the um, documents that we would create um, would be suitable for moving into their technical file um, as they go through that development process. But we have the systems all in place for developing technical files and producing technical files. Okay. And your focus is uh, very much on, the, on wearables rather than implantables, isn't it? Yes. Well, yes. So I, I meant to say at the very beginning, actually, I think what we, we complement what I think Anne's going to talk about later in terms of we don't directly do implantable devices. That's not covered by our, our 13485 process. Um, but obviously with every implantable, there's a device outside um, in, terms, in, in terms of talking to it or communicating to it. Um, and there's quite a lot of neurotechnology that isn't implantable based devices as well. Um, there are some areas whereby we have done some work on, on devices that are certainly prototypes for implantables through our electronics facility and our, our patterning facility. So it might be, for example, that um, Anne's team at Maisie decides that they want to use the technology that we have in order to implement into their implantable device. That's fine, they can do that, but obviously they would then need to put in, determine what those, those QMS steps would need to be in order to make that suitable for that particular application. Um, so we understand the process, but we don't have the capability of making the implantables um, in, in the way that Maisie does. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Well, Tom, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, if, if anyone has any more questions for Tom, we'll be having a panel discussion later or do um, continue to, to type questions into the Q&A box. Um, but I'll hand over now to um, Anne, who's going to give us an introduction to uh, the Maisie facility. Anne's the Deputy uh, Director of the Maisie facility. So Anne, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. And thank you, Tom. What a great way to, um, to be introduced and what a great way to follow up. Um, I think it's it's been really brilliant to to have the introduction to the UK CPI before I talk about Macy. The the focus of Macy has really been on developing a facility for the manufacture of active implants and surgical instruments, which we found 
for the for the most complex of the surgical instruments was something that was missing from the um, UK and EU network of manufacturing facilities for medical devices, probably because of the complexity of the processes. So the um, MACI initiative is um, started within a group of three universities, both um, UCL, where I'm from, uh, University of Newcastle, and it's led by Professor Sebastian Orselin at KCL. So altogether, this is a relatively new initiative. It's funded by the Wellcome Trust. It will house over 50 process equipments when it is operational. This will be managed under a QMS, so ISO 13485, as Tom mentioned, for the UK CPI initiative. And um, the operation are the currently targeted at sort of middle of 2023 with a much earlier involvement with potential users because we want to target our process development to meet the demands of the UK research and SMEs networks in terms of what we focus on for first devices. So at this, this time we are in the uh, detailed engineering phase and we want to hear from you to tune our offering to make sure that it meets your demand. So I'll just Give you a quick overview of the of the talk but we'll really focus today on what macy is why we exist what facilities we will have available and i'll t touch a little bit on the on the product journey at this time and our timeline so what is macy um if i can get to the next slide it's a bit um, jumpy um so we're going to have a fully staffed facility which is focused on the manufacture of active implants and surgical instruments. As I've explained, the importance here is on the fully staffed facilities. So there will be engineers, regulatory experts, technicians working in the clean rooms. So this is not a facility which is available for hire where you send your own team to come and manufacture your own devices. You interact with us on um, the point of view of a design and collaboration, but the manufacture is performed by our own team. Why does Macy exist? Um, to enable funded research to achieve its full impact. And by funded research, we're really initially targeting academic researchers, but we understand that SMEs have very, very similar needs when they are at their early stage of inception to what academic researchers have. So what I mean by funded research is more generally, let's say, very small batch prototype manufacture that are required in the early stage of development of medical devices of the most complex types. Our aim is to supply prototypes for clinical evaluation, to accelerate the translation for future benefits of patients. So that's a little bit of a, a long vision, but we understand that in this field, one of the biggest um, causes of attrition from early stage funding and um, devices that never leave the lab is because there are no manufacturing facilities to turn a prototype device that has been fabricated within an academic institution into something that can actually be tested into humans. So this is the gap we're filling. And how we fill this gap, we have several directions that are, um, oh, well, it's several aspects of the approach that are all equally important. So. One aspect, and the, the, the first one is adapt the design for manufacturing. So it's really important to realize that one manufacturing method that is suitable for a very hand, hands-on labor intensive prototype development within a research lab is not necessarily the most suitable method to batch manufacture. And everybody who produces a device has an intention that they will be using to humans. So we want to work with the PIs to adapt their ideas to um, apply the principles of design for manufacture to make sure that we accelerate the transition. When they leave Macy, they're ready to go and work with other institutions within the UK to manufacture larger batches. What we will have in Hertz is the ability to do microelectronics assembly. And as um, Tom mentioned, we'll also have the ability of subcontracting for all things that we do not cover ourselves. Hermetic sealing is one of the most important aspects of uh, devices that, are, that include electronics and work within the human environment. So this will be a strength of Macy. 
also will offer device assembly and testing with supply chain management. So as I said, for subcontractors and for um, materials um, providers, as well as um, documentation and validation, which again was mentioned by previous speakers as being an extremely important step for further translation of devices. So what will we be targeting? So AIMD, so active implantable medical devices, generally speaking, we've discussed the fact that there, there will be a very rigid encapsulation, so a hermetic sealing method, but we are also going to be working with sort of encapsulation, so new, different technologies that enable the long-term use of electronics within the body, which enable different form factors. So here's an example of a um, cochlear implant. What's particular about it is the soft encapsulation used here enables a flexible implant with a rigid encapsulation or rigid package here, which is hermetic, and a soft encapsulation around here. So we have expertise in both. We will be developing electronics, which will also be, be useful for complex surgical instruments, such as multimodal robots. Um, Patient-specific surgical instruments will be possible to manufacture within Macy. Um, the point of Macy really is that we want to take the research products from as far as a researcher can develop them within the current existing facilities of most universities and bridge the gap to the moment where you can start working with larger manufacturers or, um, or setting your own manufacturing system. So to do this, we seek early engagement with users to discuss technologies. So if you want to know when to contact us, as early as possible, I think is the answer, so that we can discuss with you how you will be interacting with Macy, at what stage the um, devices are manufactured is usually quite further down the line from when you start working with us. Um, again, the, the, the second box here really insists on the, the point of design for, for manufacture. Uh, we also are very keen to show that there may be different design solutions for the same problem. So, so as to understand <clears throat> that the approach of a researcher may be one of many possible options. And this is because of that, that we know that Macy can service a wide range of devices because we will have flexibility in all processes and intelligent design um, is one of our key strengths. <clears throat> we also will use obviously standard methods and processes so that we have a standard approach for uh, rapid translation and as I mentioned for product documentation um, and everything being um, performed under a quality management system. So what will Macy look like? So here we have, a fun, I love this uh, 3D model. I think it's great, we can see that, we can see us working, I can see myself working in the clean room there. Um, we are embedded within Sintomas's MedTech Hub at KCL, which is extremely important because in terms of creating connections, being part of a larger network, the location enables us to have both extremely close contacts with clinicians, obviously being within uh, Sintomas's at KCL, but also being within the MedTech hub is fantastic because it means that we will also have proximity of other innovative groups, smart SMEs and larger companies that all work in the same um, field and therefore all encounter the same challenges. And we think it will, this will really foster an, an innovative, creative dynamic that should also accelerate the access to further funding, development of devices, reach further beyond the first clinical evaluation. So our location is extremely important. In terms of the content of this, <coughs> excuse me, we'll have a suite of clean rooms that have different purposes from um, a original, um, from, from an in initial preparation room to a grade eight, clean room and then cleaner rooms ISO 7 with a laminar flow at ISO 5 for the most precise cleanness operation. <clears throat> Which um, all, all of the, the suites are um, under environmental monitoring to validate the cleaning procedures but also to certify all clean rooms with um, particle monitoring and microbial tests performed as part of all routine maintenance. In terms of the equipment we have 
here and just listing a few of them. I'll give you a moment to read through them. But I also have a much more detailed list of equipment at the end of the slides as the sort of hidden slides. So if you're interested in more detailed equipment, um, uh, we, can, we can discuss that later. Whilst I'm on this slide, I'm just going to jump onto one of the questions. Could you do some non-invasive BCI prototypes? Yes, so we're not focusing on one type of product. What we have is a range of processes and services that can be adapted flexibly to your device. So if you have a design which is a BCI prototype, then that's what we'll be making. If you have a design which is an implant for uh, EMG recording for the control of a prosthesis, that's what we will be making. We're not proposing here to make a specific type of device. What we're proposing is to make devices whose common point is that they're inside the body. They're going in either as complex surgical instruments uh, briefly within the body or as active implants for a very long period of time within the body. And so for the active implant, we obviously have the needs of um, the, the leak testing here and the primary packaging stations aren't necessary for helium, um, sorry, for helium leak testing, so for hermetic packaging. We'll have the electronics benches here with screen printing, which enables us to print our own tracks. We have instrument assembly, as I said, with the laminar flow, which um, gives us an ISO 5 level. And we have a series of additive manufacturing and laser welding machines equipment here, which enables us to do the manufacture of some parts of the surgical instruments and assembly of the implants. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the Macy is a new facility, so it's a new initiative. Our team is currently being built, so we already have obviously our um, leadership executive board with a quality systems manager, Dr. Heisman, who um, is from KCL, and within the core staff, uh, we are joined today on the chat by um, on the meeting, sorry, by our process engineer, process engineer, which is Gabriel Jabust, and manufacturing quality assurance Helio Fazenda. We're currently broadening the, the team by recruiting for the other roles. So briefly, as I said, I was going to touch on the product journey. I just want to show you this and insist really on the when to contact us. When do we expect the owner of the device, the user of Macy to contact us? As early as possible, because we have a series of steps to go through um, I'll mention IP um, retention and sharing just in a moment, actually, that's really good timing for the question. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm answering the Q&A questions as I'm speaking. <laughs> I just haven't just suddenly thought about IP. Uh, so I just wanted to show you here on this slide that really the, the manufacture takes place very late in the, in the process. I don't know if you can see my mouth, but manufacture is number 11. So we have a series of steps to take with you to discuss your um, material specification, to review your design, to propose a process for manufacture based on your quality parameters and cost calculation, cost implications, so that we agree on the method for manufacture, on the material that will be used, on the process validation methods as well. And every, all of this needs to be done in discussion with you before we can actually start with the manufacturer. Following the manufacturer, step 12 is the control, the quality control, and finally is the batch release. At that time, when we reach step 13, we have a documented process that is ready to be transferred to um, further manufacturing facilities or to be repeated within our center if you need, within our clean room, if you need further small batch production. In terms of attitude to IP, our attitude is very, very similar to that of the, the UK CPI, and I think it's understandable that all manufacturing facilities will have a, a similar attitude. We are very clear that the IP on the product is owned by the person, by the user, and remains owned by the user. But the technology that we develop within our, cent within our clean rooms to manufacture these devices, if we develop new technologies around the use of um, silicon rubber encapsulation, for example, this IP, which is developed by our team to solve a range of um, well, to, to solve a problem for a range of devices, is owned by Macy. So Macy owns the IP that it develops and is free to use it for a range of devices. What you bring to us 
is your own IP and we have non-disclosure agreements in place. We do not use what you brought to us for other devices. What we contribute is what we can use. So I hope that answers the question. Final few slides, um, and we'll have probably a bit of time to discuss uh, the, the specific equipment list if you're interested, but for the moment, in terms of timeline, um, so as I said, this is a new initiative. At this stage, we'd like to invite interested users to discuss their needs with us to help us fine tune our services and select a few flagship projects. So the, the physical constructions of the clean room has been delayed because of the impact of COVID-19 and will take place in 2021. We would like in early 2022, having had time to discuss um, funding requirements, needs, timelines of various researchers, we will be hoping to see in February 2022 the first flagship products to be selected. So these will be the first products that will be produced through Macy as a way of demonstrating on capabilities with um, flagship product validation um, for December 2022. And in 2023 is when we open for all users. So I'm moving on to questions and I see um, Couple of questions, quite a couple more questions have appeared on the QA. So, in research grant applications, would, be, would it be possible to involve Macy as a co I or collaborator subcontractor or flexible? And um, I think we, we would only be co I's if we were to do part of the development of the technology. So, if you're interested in developing something where there is a requirement for a new technology that's basically the current uh, packaging technologies, if I'm thinking about implants are not satisfactory, then there would be a development element which would involve us as co-ice, but this is not the focus of the way we will be working. Mostly we're working as collaborators or subcontractors on the ground, depending on what the grant allows, where you um, work with us on a service basis. Uh, so do you license your IP when appropriate? That's a really good question. And I think this is one of those where I'll have to refer to you um, for at a later stage, because we haven't at this stage discussed how we would be licensing our own IP. But obviously, if we develop IP on um, new processes that then need to be transferred for further commercial production, then at that stage, we will discuss how the um, of this IP can be transferred to the commercial manufacturer. I think I've answered all four questions on the Q&A box. Um, yeah, thanks. So Anna. if you want to go through uh, more, um, more details on the processes we offer, uh, otherwise also for information, um, although my name is Anne Hustenberg and here is my email address, um, we have a generic email address that reaches directly everybody in the team at KCL, so you're likely to have much uh, quicker answer if you address any future, future requests to macy at kcl.ac.uk. Thank you very much, Anne. And if anyone's got more questions, then please do put them into the uh, Q&A box. We've got a, a few more minutes for questions. Um, one, one question for me is, when, when you are fully operational, how many devices do you see that you'll be working on at, at any one time? Um, if by working on, you mean how many different types of device will be under manufacture at the same time, I think the numbers will be quite low. But if by working on, you mean how many will we, how many research group will we be interacting, then that's going to be a much larger number. The point is that we, we expect and hope that researchers will be contacting us very early on, so much before we start manufacture. So whilst we may only be manufacturing two or three different types of devices at once because of the timeline of the manufacture, we expect to have a much larger number of groups in contact with us going through the early stage process of uh, working with us to adapt their design for manufacture, working with us to think about their, the materials they are using, the, uh, develop their regulatory plans, their clinical evaluation plan, and all of these aspects must be in place before you start manufacturing something. Yeah. We've got a question here from Benedict. Um, who asks, as a manufacturer of components, uh, she's from Johnson Matthew, um, how can we help you when you require a subcontract uh, to subcontract some services? 
Um, I think the short answer for this is that one of the most difficult aspects of the subcontracting will be the requirements of, of falling within our quality management system. Uh, and that will mean creating a um, clear sub subcontracting um, line between the provider of the components and the user who, who will be us. So um, I'm not the QMS expert, obviously, I'm an electronics engineer, so uh, this is really stretching my knowledge, but my understanding is that quality management system are very stringent as to how you work with subcontractors. Yeah. All text project can fail, I see, sorry. Sorry, Charlie, go on. No, 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 no. Go, go for it, do, do answer that. Yeah, all, all um, tech projects can fail. Do you offer any kind of warranty backed by your professional indemnity insurance? Uh, so no, the, the responsibility for the project is that of the user of Macy. Macy guarantees that what we do is verified by the test we perform. And so if we think, for example, um, about it, if the device is made as to the requirements of the user, but functionally this device was poorly designed and does not have the desired effect when it's tested in human, that is because of the concept of the device as per the function described by the, by the researcher. So if you made a deep brain stimulator where the, you design your stimulator and the stimulation intensity is just not enough to have an effect, your device will not have an impact on the patient, but this is not because of Macy's manufacturer. Macy will manufacture your devices as per your functional requirements. And so the, the, the liability is usually going to be within the researcher, unless the device fails because Macy's package failed. And then the responsibility is with the, the uh, manufacturer, so Macy. You're, you're going to be building up uh, some real expertise in helping companies through the regulatory um, pathway. If a company already knows how they're going to manufacture their device but needs support just with regulations, would you be able to help them or, or is it only companies that you'll be doing the device manufacture for? To start with, we're seeing a role as mostly to help the people that come through Macy for the use of the services only just because of capacity. Obviously, I cannot say what the, um, what the future will bring us. Certainly, 2020 is the worst year to be thinking about the future, really. Uh, we have no idea what will happen in 2021, 22, 23. At the moment, our vision is that we expect to have a demand in terms of manufacture that will fully occupy all regulatory expert. If there is a huge demand from um, companies, as you described, that have only a need for regulatory expertise in the field of complex surgical instruments and active implants, then there are certainly opportunities for us to share this knowledge through providing regulatory advice. This is not something we have currently envisaged. We did a survey of the, the field a couple of years ago to see what the need was to justify the existence of Macy. And we found the need to be much more focused around manufacture with regulatory support rather than sing, single sort of regulatory support as a standalone service. But if that changes from the results of our survey a few years ago to 2021, 22, 23, we'll certainly be evaluating that. Okay, and we've got one, one more question here from Jonathan O'Keefe. What about the software layer around active devices? Do you have an interest in developing software frameworks to support the deployment of the hardware? Um, can I, can I take the, uh, the short answer is um, I'm a little bit scared when it comes to software layers, software developments. Again, because I'm not the expert, I'm a hardware person. We are part of the Welcome EPSRC Center for Medical Engineering and all quality management system lead is actually quality management systems lead because she works within the um, so CME, so Center for Medical Engineering. And they are there setting up a much broader quality management to service both software and hardware development. Macy is really limiting to hardware development and manufacturing thereof. Any further questions, I think, if you email macy at kcl.ac.uk, you'll be put through to the relevant person with the QMS knowledge, and she can talk to you much more about the interaction between software and hardware. Okay, well, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. And that's, that's been really, really interesting. Um, and I'll be around for the panel session at the end. So if you do have any uh, more questions, then, then keep them coming. 
Um, but for now, Anne, thank you very much. And I'd like to now introduce uh, Matt Taylor, who is director of the York Health Economics uh, Consortium, um, who's going to give us an introduction to health economics. Matt, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Charlie, thank you. Um, so, so yeah, my, my name is Matthew Taylor, I'm director of York Health Economics Consortium. I'll, I'll try and talk about health economics for the next, next few minutes. I'm aware that for, for quite a lot of you, or maybe even most of you, health economics is, is way off into the distance, potentially even, even over the horizon at this point. So I want to try and keep this very, very top level. So I'll, I'll just give you a quick background to who we are, what we do. We're, we are York Health Economics Consortium. We're based at and owned by the University of York, which is kind of where health economics was invented back in the 1970s. And our work is generally split between the public and the private sector. So we do, we do lots of work in the public sector for, for groups such as NICE, for Public Health England, um, local NHS um, decision makers and so forth. And, and I think about two thirds of our work is for the private sector. That, that's for the big pharmaceutical, the little pharmaceutical companies and, and lots of different med tech companies as well. So just to try and cover very briefly what, what health economics even is, I suppose I, I mentioned that York invented this kind of thing back in the 1970s and health economics back then really, really was as, as simple a case as saying it was, it was more balanced for your buck. Nowadays it's become a lot more sophisticated, we've got this big long long waffly thing, this is the first page of a, of a 250 page textbook. I'm not going to go into, into detail on this kind of thing now, but what I do want to do is just try and cover in the next 10 or 15 minutes, try and condense that, that 250 page textbook down into the, to the very simple basics, which really are all about measuring costs, measuring benefits, and, and trying to make some kind of case of weighing them up against each other. So maybe, maybe starting off by, by trying to define what do we even mean by costs, it's, it's a relatively simple question, and it's relatively simple to answer, I suppose. Costs are anything that we, we might be paying for in this case. I suppose who we is, 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 is open to debate. I, I'd describe we as being the healthcare provider, but sometimes the question can be phrased slightly different and, and it might be society paying for it or an individual hospital paying for it. But really we're, we're looking at what we call all relevant costs and consequences. So these things might include clearly the, the technology itself that we're paying for, uh, maybe staff time that goes into, into running that technology, doing whatever it needs to do. Um, other equipment that goes alongside it. If the use of this technology means that we need to use other equipment, then, then that would be a cost that we're interested in. Of course, there might be lots of saved costs. It might be that this technology replaces something else. It might be that it, it manages to reduce the, some other healthcare resource use, like the number of hospitalizations or GP visits and so forth. And pretty much, Anything else is there's no real limit to, to what we might consider to be relevant costs. I, I think every technology will have its own definitions of what, what we describe as relevant and not relevant. Lots of other, other factors we need to think about though when we're talking about what costs are. I suppose one question I, I alluded to earlier is, is who's paying? Who, who are we saying is paying for this? Are we talking about the NHS as a whole paying for it? Are we talking about um, an individual provider or the commissioners within the NHS? They're, they're all interested in slightly different costs. So when we're trying to, to add up these costs, really, we, we need to make sure that we're very specific about, about who we're addressing this question for. When do they pay is, is clearly important as well. Um, it's, it's often a big ask to, to expect the NHS to invest, say, 10 million pounds today to save 11 million pounds in 20 years time. Um, you know, the, the net saving might be a million pounds and, and that's all very well, but, but I think you'll generally find you've got a tough job trying to get people to sign up to that kind of thing. So it doesn't mean we don't do that, but we need to think about when those costs are going to occur. Um, and, and a slightly more controversial question is, when we say all relevant costs and consequences, how do we even define relevant? So are, are the costs related to this particular intervention? Are, are they related to it directly? So in some cases we can say, absolutely, that's right. If, you know, if, if we're paying for an intervention that gets patients um, to be discharged early from hospital, we can say that the cost of the extra bed days is a directly relevant cost to this particular intervention. On the other hand, there might be, there might be some kind of indirect roundabout costs. And, it, this, it could be as far-fetched as saying, well, this intervention, it, it's so effective, it's keeping people alive. Now, that's a really good thing that we're keeping people alive. That's essentially what healthcare is there for a lot of the time. Um, but if we keep people alive, um, they don't necessarily live happily 
ever after, um, they might go on to develop other, other complications completely unrelated to the, to the intervention in question. But the fact that we've given them this intervention means they go on to live longer and therefore go on to develop cancer or Alzheimer's disease, dementia, um, get all sorts of other very expensive things in the future. Should we throw those costs into our analyses? Well, I think you find that health economists uh, uh, are in disagreement about, about this. You'll find a, a group that say they are real costs and we do need to factor them in. And you'll get another group of people who say that, that unfairly biases against interventions that keep people alive for longer. So it's, it's a kind of perverse incentive there. So I don't think we've ever quite solved that. And it's worth me saying at this stage that, that health economics is a relatively new field still and, and we're still grappling with quite a lot of these issues. So I just want to give you a very simple example of, of how we would go about undertaking an economic evaluation of, of a, an intervention. So, so I'll keep this very, very hypothetical. I don't want to get bogged down in, in real situations because um, I want to keep it very, very top level. But imagine that we've got two available treatments. We've got a new neurotechnology and I'll call that treatment A and we've got existing care, which is, which is called treatment B. Um, you can see very briefly here that treatment A is a bit more effective than treatment B. You get 75% of people treated effectively, however we might define effective. Um, however, it's slightly um, less safe in, in that we see 40% of patients experiencing adverse events compared with only 30% for treatment B. Treatment A is a bit more costly. We pay £1,000 for it as opposed to £600 for treatment B. And then we're also interested in some other consequences. So if a patient is treated ineffectively, if the treatment doesn't work first time, we might assume that there's an extra cost of £2,000. It might be some additional surgery or, or something like that that kicks in. And we might say that when an, a patient experiences a complication, an adverse event, we, we again have an extra cost. I've obviously in £400 in this case, it might be just some extra health care that, that needs to be provided for those particular patients. So what we would do is try and develop some kind of economic model. In this case, I'll, I'll use a decision tree to illustrate how we would do that. We very simply start off by saying if, if people receive treatment A, what might happen to them? They might be treated successfully with a 0.75 chance, or they might be treated unsuccessfully with a 0.25 or 25% chance. If they are treated successfully, they might have a first event with a 40% chance, or they might have no adverse events with a 60% chance. And the same down at this bottom end. So what we end up with is four potential pathways for, for patients to go down in this, in this very, very simplified example. Now, what we're interested in is saying if a real cohort of patients was given treatment A. So I'll use a nice big round number like a thousand and say if a thousand people receive treatment A, we can then work through our decision tree to work out how many people would be treated successfully and then of those, how many would have adverse events, how many would not have adverse events, how many would not be treated successfully with and without adverse events. And therefore, we can account for our thousand patients throughout this model. Obviously, in the, in the real world, the, this decision tree would be far more complex. We might say that when they're treated unsuccessfully, they would go on to the next line of treatment. It might be that we have death built into the model and so on. But I, I just want to keep it nice and simple for now. We start with a thousand patients and we should ideally always make sure that we end with a thousand patients accounted for. Now what we're interested in is, is what the payoffs would be for these, these four branches. So we know that if a patient is treated successfully but experiences adverse events, we can go back to the inputs I described earlier and say they cost a thousand pounds for the treatment. They, they cost nothing for their, for their extra intervention because they were treated successfully but they incur a cost of 400 pounds for the adverse events and therefore each of those patients will cost 1,400 pounds. Now there were 300 patients that went down that branch in, in this model and therefore 300 people each costing 1,400 pounds gives a, a kind of subtotal for that particular branch of the tree of 420,000 pounds. And then we repeat this exact same process for each of the other branches down the tree. In this case, the cost per patient in, in the second arm is only a thousand pounds because they don't need retreatment and they don't need their adverse events dealing with. And we do the same for the other branches, getting the little subtotals all along. And then ultimately, a big total cost for that cohort of patients. So, so what we're saying there is if a thousand people received this, this new technology, treatment A, it would cost £1,660,000. 
And then we repeat the whole process for treatment B. And of course, treatment B has slightly different inputs. It has different rates of success and it has different rates of adverse events. So we would map, map the patients through the model, a thousand people. We end up with different numbers at the end of each branch just because the, the pathways, I suppose the pathways look the same, but we've got different proportions of patients going down each of those branches. And then of course the payoffs will be slightly different for treatment B as well, because treatment B itself is a less expensive intervention. It's only 600 pounds for the treatment, but we still need to factor in the costs of retreatment and adverse events. And we, we take exactly the same approach that we did for treatment A. And in this case, we, we end up with a grand total um, for treatment B of 1,720,000. So if we, if we compare our total costs, treatment A against treatment B, we can quite clearly see that treatment A will have an, what we'd call an extra cost of, of minus 120,000. Um, and therefore, we'd conclude that this intervention is, is cost saving. If costs are all that we're interested in, we would be very happy to approve treatment A, this new treatment, um, and stop using treatment B for, for that particular cohort of patients. Now, that's not all there is to it. Of course, we're interested in lots of other things. So I, I've, I've described uncertainty here. I, I said that the effectiveness of treatment A is 75%, but, but you understand from clinical trials and, and any other sources of evidence, that we have confidence intervals around, around these kind of inputs. We, we think the base case might be 75%, but it might be as high or low as say 95% or as low, low as 50%. We, we don't know, and there's always uncertainty in the world. So with, with our evaluations, we would always undertake something called sensitivity analysis, where, where essentially we vary every single input to the model by, by its plausible inputs, by its interquartile ranges, by its 95% confidence intervals, whatever we want to do. And really try and assess the impact that that, that has on our conclusion. I suppose in very basic terms, we, we would like to be able to generate an overall percentage likelihood that we think this intervention will actually save costs. So rather than saying, yes, it's going to save £120,000, it's preferable that we can say that there's a 76% chance that this intervention is likely to save costs and a 24% chance that, that we might be wrong about that. But this, this kind of uncertainty analysis helps, helps address that. And then another very important factor is, uh, I've kind of been talking only about costs for now, but clearly healthcare gives a lot more than cost benefits. It, it makes people feel better, it improves their quality of life, it improves their length of life. And so we might want to, to factor in all of these non-financial benefits. I think we normally would. Um, in, in the world of devices, that's done less so than it is in the world of pharmaceuticals. But what we try and show here is, is a kind of quadrant type approach where, where we show cost on the y-axis or incremental cost on the y-axis, where, where upwards means this intervention is more costly than current care and downwards means it's, it's going to save costs. And then effectiveness is on the x-axis, so towards the right shows that we're, we're improving health, towards the left means that, that we're harming health, it's less effective than current care. Now if we focus only on costs, we're essentially saying that anything in the top two quadrants, we won't, we won't approve it, it will be more costly, we don't, we don't want to do that. And anything in the bottom, we will want to do it because it saves money. So that's irrespective of how good the intervention is, how, how well it's improving people's quality of life. In health economics, we've developed a concept called the quality adjusted life year or qualies. And that, that's a way of combining quality of life and length of life to, to give us an overall aggregated kind of score for patients, their overall health well-being. And that's kind of where, where we measure this, this x-axis. So we can, we can say that this new intervention gives more qualies than current care or it gives less qualies than, than current care and factor it in this way. If we do that, then actually we, we kind of come up with another decision point. We come up with this diagonal dotted line, which is really telling us that, that I suppose you could look at it two ways. The more expensive something is, the better it needs to be in order for us to be able to justify that expenditure. Or another way of looking at it is the better it is, the more we are willing to pay for that particular intervention. So what we're really saying there is anything above and to the left of that dotted line, we think that the costs would, would outweigh the benefits and would be, we wouldn't generally approve that intervention. Anything to the bottom and to the right of it, we think that the benefits outweigh the costs and therefore we would approve it. So, for example, a technology that, that was demonstrated to be more costly but more effective and, and happened to fall below that dotted line, we would typically approve that, that kind of technology and say it is a cost-effective intervention for the NHS. 
So as a, as a very brief summary, I think, I think it's worth emphasizing that health economics is absolutely vital. It's, it's often the hurdle that, that lots of technologies fall out. They've, they've demonstrated they're safe, they've demonstrated that they're effective, um, but they fail at the very last step to demonstrate that they're cost effective. Um, despite it being an important hurdle in that way, it's, it's often the most neglected. It's certainly the one that's, that's thought of last, I suppose, because it's the last hurdle in, in that process. Um, but to, to echo the, the thoughts of the other presenters today, I don't think it's ever too early to, to think about these things. Um, too, too often we see, we see the, the health economics arguments being made at the, at the 11th hour, and we, we come to realise that actually the whole crux of the health economics argument depends on some, maybe some long-term savings that, that we think probably would be there, but we just don't have any evidence to be able to back up that argument. And, and we generally say, if we'd, if we'd thought of this three years ago, we could have easily built that kind of cost collection thing into our into our clinical trial and you'd have been able to demonstrate that as it was because you hadn't thought through the health economics you didn't pick it up and now we're left with this this big gap of uncertainty where we think you might be cost effective but we're unable to convince the nhs that you are um, and likewise it, it might be that there are other health benefits things like the quality adjusted life years that i've touched on um, it's very, very simple to include quality of life um, measurement scores into clinical trials. It, it generally doesn't add to cost, doesn't add to the, to the trial design itself. But if, if you think of it nice and early, it means you're capturing all the right things and, and you'll make life a lot easier for yourself when it, when it comes to the health economics later on. And aside from anything else, I think it's a good strategic decision because if, if you do do some of the very, very simple back of the envelope type calculations early on, it can, it can give you an idea of, of what we might call the economically justifiable price for your technology. So it can help with that price setting. It can even help with target populations because as, as, you, as you tweak and vary baseline characteristics of patients, you know, you make, you make the baseline risk of adverse events higher or lower or so on. You can start to work out which particular groups and subgroups of patients you've, you've got the best health economics arguments for. So I think that's everything um, that I wanted to cover there, Charlie, thank you. Brilliant, thanks. That was that was incredibly useful. Um, we've got uh, a two-part question here from Christopher Bullock. Um, part A: Where do you get your in? I think input data for the models. Do you have access to de-identify clinical data, for instance? And part B is: How do you go about assessing the economics of an intervention whilst it's still in the preclinical phases? No direct trial data, in other words. Great. So, um, lots of lots of different sources for the for the input data. So, the the clinical data usually would come from a, a I mean, ideally a randomised control trial. I suppose even more ideally, it would come from a big meta analysis of, of multiple randomised control trials. It, it, we would typically do a big systematic literature review and make sure we've we've pulled in every little bit of clinical evidence. There are, there are other inputs to the model that are much easier to collect. So if, if say, for example, the, the whole argument around your technology is that you're going to save GP visits and you, you've been able to demonstrate that you can save three GP visits per, per patient that, that gets this. We know what the cost of a GP visit is. That, that's very well publicized, well, um, easy, easy for us to find. There are lots of databases with those kind of costs out there. So the cost of a GP visit comes from, from a pre-existing source but the number of GP visits you'll save has to come from, from the trial itself because that will be specific to your technology. And then part two, yeah, well, how do you go about this early on? I said, I said it's never too early to do it. Um, sometimes it, it literally is a back of the envelope type calculation. You, you can do this kind of work in, in an hour using a very similar type structure to the, to the example I just gave with four little pathways and outcomes. Um, often, I, it sounds silly, but I, I just recommend using clinical opinion or even just your own best guesswork at, at the start. Sometimes you, you can start to develop the, the kind of economic arguments just with, with absolutely made up data because you can, you can start to say, well, let's say it does save three GP visits. As I said, we know a GP visit might cost, let's say, 30 pounds. If you save three of those, that's 90 pounds. You don't really need trial data to, to, to be able to start telling you what your economic arguments are. If you were planning on, um, charging £2,000 for that technology and, and the G safe GP visits were the only savings you were going to make, then you know right away, you don't need the trial data to tell you that actually you're probably overcharging for that technology, that, that back of the envelope calculation can, can work it out. What models can be very, very useful for at this stage is, is saying, 
which thing is the biggest driver of the model. So let's let's play around and we do that sensitivity analysis and, and see which, which input seems to drive the results more than anything else. That then helps to make sure you're capturing that particular thing in your trial itself. It, it, it tells you where you need to focus on. You don't necessarily need to have hard baseline numbers to start off that sensitivity analysis. You can just play around with, with kind of your, your own homemade inputs at that stage just to understand the, the narrative around. Yeah, yeah, that's very useful. Um, we've got a question here from David Wallace um, asking whether you are analysing the cost of COVID-19 in detail uh, to establish whether earlier intervention invest and investment could have saved lives. Um, we we haven't. Some some people I, I believe have, and, and lots of people have been developing this type of model. I think that the, we found actually from, from our side slight, slightly different answer to your question, David. But but we found that that we've suddenly started having to reevaluate lots of our our previous economic evaluations in light of of the new kind of post COVID world, I suppose. So. It might be that, say, two years ago, I, I, again, the, the example I just gave, if, if a technology, maybe maybe the benefits of a particular technology are that you can now do home monitoring of your, your blood glucose instead of going into a, into a hospital. It might be that two years ago, we found that technology wasn't cost effective because actually the cost of going into a hospital isn't that much anyway. It was fairly cheap. Um, the technology at home is quite expensive and, and there isn't really the economic case. All of a sudden now, the cost of going into hospital is quite a lot more because of all the various precautions and, and so on that are having to take place and as well as the knock-on impact of, of lots of patients being in hospital and increasing costs. So all of a sudden technologies that we were saying weren't cost effective two years ago have suddenly kind of got this new new angle and, and, and it's brought a whole different dimension to, to things totally unrelated to COVID. But, but because of COVID being there, it means that the cost effectiveness has, has suddenly changed. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure lots of people are doing COVID. Well, they, they certainly are doing lots of COVID stuff. Um, from a health economics point of view, I, I've generally always argued that when we talk about cost effectiveness in, in healthcare, we're interested in something called opportunity costs. That's saying if, if we spend this money um, on the new technology, it means that we can't spend money on something else in the health system. So we might have to lose um, a nurse from a maternity ward, we might have to stop giving some diabetes patients their, their treatments and so on. Something has to give because the NHS has a fixed resource. With the COVID world, I think that the costs, as, as you all know, are, are kind of um, coming from the magic money tree. They're, they're not coming at all just from NHS fixed resources. We're, we're just chucking costs in at all sorts of things, paying out hundreds of million pounds for, for track and trace, but that's not necessarily coming from the NHS. So, so as a health economist, I kind of say that's probably a broader question for general economists rather than health economists, because I suppose the money that we're spending on, on all these other interventions is coming from somewhere else. It's coming from the education system, from defence, from policing, from increased taxes, whatever else it is. And that's probably outside um, my remit as a health economist. We've got a question here from uh, Melissa Hawker, who says, how do you argue the economics when treatment isn't being offered at, at all at the moment, but would clearly make a huge difference? Um, I suppose the, the, the argument is what, what do we mean by clearly would make a, a huge difference? I, I would say we, we try to measure the benefits of that treatment using quality adjusted life years. So, so does this treatment improve quality of life? Does it improve length of life? Does it, does it save costs somewhere else? That, that's what I would describe as being a huge difference. If we can monitor that, if we can measure that, capture the evidence, then, then it's an easy argument. If we can't capture it, then I suppose that raises questions of, as to whether it clearly does make a, a huge difference. I would say if you can't measure it, then by definition, it, it doesn't clearly make a huge difference. You, you, does that make sense in terms of arguing that? So it, in theory, it should be a non-question because if it's easy to measure, we don't have a problem. If it's hard to measure, then then actually it's, it's hard to ask the NHS to pay a lot of money for something. And, and as I said, they'd have to give something else up to pay for this new thing. It'd be hard to, to, to convince them to do that without the evidence. Yeah. Um, at this point, I'd like to bring um, everyone back in for the panel discussion. Um, if if um, others have uh, questions for any of the speakers from, from earlier or, or from Matt, then please do uh, type them into the Q&A box. Um, at this point, I'd like to, like to ask 
all the speakers if any, any of you have questions for each other. No? Um, well, not, not a question, but just a, a comment, if, if I may, to say, um, it, it, it does come across to me, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the ecosystem, and we do have a nice ecosystem forming here. You know, we've got Voice, which is looking at the, the, the fundamental research accents, the low TOL stuff, and obviously translation is important, but we're not a translation partner. We've got CPI, who um, are much more focused on the commercial side and taking that stuff to be able to manufacture it more at scale. Um, and then, of course, the, um, the major initiative, which is taking those very high risk devices, um, which, which need a special development route. And, you know, we do have the different bits fall, falling into place here. You're absolutely right. And I think it's, it's important, companies often think that they're, they're on their own, that, that, that there's no support out there. I think actually there is an awful lot of support in the UK if you know where to find it. Uh, so that's a call really to, to contact KTN. If you're not sure where, where that support might be, then please do get, get in touch with us. We can hopefully direct you to CPI or, or Royce or, or others, um, and we can make those connections for you. Um, I didn't mention York. Um, but actually, I do my healthcare economics in York at the CPI. And I would really iterate Matt's comments of it completely changes your thinking of when you do an early HTA of yeah, what price point you need to hit, what effectiveness you need to have. It's, it's not a technology push development route anymore. Yeah. Matt, it might be worthwhile just to give a quick overview of what NICE do and how, how they make their decisions. Yeah, so I mean, in, in general, NICE, I'll, I'll not talk about devices specifically here, but, but NICE's remit is, is to try to, I think they, they tend to argue they try to maximise health within the health system from a fixed budget. So, so they say the NHS has £110 billion to spend this year. How can we maximise health, however we define health? And, and they generally define it using qualities, qualities, quality adjusted life years, as I said. Um, so they would typically evaluate something by, by inviting a company to submit their evidence. They, the company would um, piece together all the clinical evidence, all the economics evidence, all the quality of life evidence and so forth, the safety evidence, put, put that forward to NICE. NICE takes that on board and then spends about eight to 12 weeks pulling it apart, I suppose, try, trying to really get to the bottom of it, make sure, make sure that everything's believable, make sure everything's transparent, that the company hasn't strategically left out little bits of information and, and so forth um, and then goes back to the company I suppose with with questions and said we, we, we found this paper that you didn't include or we, we couldn't manage to replicate such and such that you did um, that all kind of gets resolved and then and then a committee come together um, a re representative committee of all sorts of different backgrounds clinical economics lay people patient representatives and so on and they, they sit around the table thrash it out and and eventually pretty much vote on it and, and come out with a yes or no. NICE has kind of sub, sub um, streams, I think, for different types of technologies, whether they're pharmaceuticals, highly specialized technologies, diagnostics, or med tech. And in the med tech side, um, they tend to take a slightly simplified view. The same steps all come in, you still submit all your evidence in there. But they tend to say, we're just interested in the costs. We're not, we're not going to try and measure, measure the qualities here. We just want you to be able to demonstrate that, that by taking on your technology, the NHS will save, ultimately save some money. It might be long term, and that's absolutely fine, but, but we need to see an argument about cost savings. Um, personally, I've never quite understood why they, why they take different approaches for, for pharma and devices from, from my perspective. It all comes from the same pot of money. You, you want to make the most of that pot of money, whether it's pharma or, or medtech. I think, I think the rationale for it is, is that that medtech finds it more difficult to, to generate the evidence. And so NICE has slightly lowered the barriers in terms of the quality of the evidence you need to provide. You know, for example, you don't put forward um, triple blinded randomized control trials just because it's not feasible in, in medtech, in implantable devices and so on. Um, and therefore they, they've kind of compensated for that by saying it's just a cost analysis to, to keep it simpler in, in that way. So, so that's in, in a nutshell, I think the, the NICE process is that. 
And am I right that they will fund health economics research if if they feel it's almost there, but there just needs to be a bit bit of extra work done? Uh, it, yeah, it depends on on their, their definitions of need. I, di I didn't touch on things like value of information analysis, but quite often they'll they'll do something to say there is a gap here. Um, if only we could fill that gap, then then we would go ahead with that. They, they, they've taken different approaches in the past. Sometimes they've just said no to that technology, but come back to us in two years when you've gone away and, and generated some new evidence. Sometimes they've, they've said yes, but only on the condition that you spend the next two years collecting and generating this evidence, and then we re we reserve the right to to change our mind if, if the evidence doesn't back up what, what you were saying. And then other times, you're right, they, they funded, they, they've actually put a recommendation to fund that, that research as well. So it's, it's, it's not a straightforward thing, you get different answers every time. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. But I think the, the consensus from, from all of you today is that um, companies and academics should get in touch with you as early as possible um, to start the conversation. Um, if we don't have, uh, any further questions then I think we might um, wrap up so I'd just like to say a, a final thank you to all of the speakers from today um, it's been really really informative um, hopefully you've all now uh, got a better of idea of how all of these organizations can help um, this presentation this webinar will be available on YouTube um, in the next couple of days and we will be sharing the presentations as well with you um, in a couple of days uh, so I'd just like to say a final uh, thank you to all of the presenters and thank you all for listening as well.